Now that the technical issues are sorted out, we can start with the content. Today's session is on how can digital technologies help reduce inequalities in water security. And the objective of this webinar is to give a broad overview of what is out there, what kind of digital technologies are being used at the moment, what are the promising ones that could help not only improve water security, but, security, but also reduce inequalities in access to water and in access to water resources as well as vulnerabilities to water-related risks. It's also an opportunity to initiate a discussion on the challenges related to applying digital technologies in development cooperation with a focus on water. Now, I would like to take a few moments also to introduce the people involved in organizing this webinar. Um, so I've already introduced myself, and we have two uh, brilliant presenters today. We have Annika Kramer from Adelphi, and uh, Professor Dragan Savic from KWR and University of Exeter. We will also have interventions from Daniel Maselli, who is the SDC uh, Réseau Coordinator, as well as a Réseau member Jacques Louvat from Helveta Swiss Inter Corporation. And finally, last but not least, we have everyone who is supporting the organization of this webinar in the background, Martin Lang, Elodie Feijou, and Ege Akiol. Thank you, everyone. Let me now hand over briefly to my colleague, Daniel Maselli, who is Réseau Focal Point at SDC, who is going to briefly introduce the Réseau and the Trend Observatory. Daniel is a Senior Policy Advisor to the Global Program Water and the Focal Point of the SDC Water Network Réseau. Daniel, over to you. A warm welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to have this first webinar in 2020, as was mentioned uh, just uh, by Melissa. Um, I've joined recently as a focal point, so I'm not yet uh, very experienced in that field, but very eager to learn more. And um, maybe to give you the broader context, um, I think that our global program Water uh, has really uh, had the intention to try to anticipate uh, new themes, uh, new possibilities that uh, emerge. And that's why this uh, initiative, pioneering one of a trend observatory was created some time ago. And today's webinar is linked to this trend observatory as a, an innovative instrument and uh, linked in particular to the first so-called trend sheet, which some of you hopefully have seen and possibly read on digital technologies. It's actually the base of today's webinar. And if you had a look at it, it has uh, flagged four benefits. It's uh, one, increasing transparency. Second, facilitating the participation and access to information. Third, improving monitoring of water resources and services. And finally, the fourth one, promoting pro poor water financing and tariffs. That were the four benefits that were flagged uh, in the first trend sheet. But today with the two presentations, I'm sure we'll discover more. And I look forward to that and hand over and back to Melissa. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this uh, great introduction. I would also like to ask everyone online if they could quickly introduce themselves by saying their name, organization, and the country where they're based in the chat box. I will do so uh, myself here, just so we have an idea of it online. And while I'm doing this, I would also like to quickly introduce the agenda for our meeting. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, two presentations and a, a discussion afterwards. Um, so let me now introduce our, our first speaker, who is Professor, Professor Dragan uh, Savic. Professor Dragan Savic joined uh, KWR Water Research Institute in the Netherlands as CEO on, in 2018. Uh, before joining KWR, he was a director and co-founder of the Center for Water System in Exeter, uh, where he also uh, teaches as a professor and he leads an internationally recognized group for excellence in water and environmental science research. And today, Professor Savic will present uh, the potential and challenges associated with a digital water future. Now, I'm just gonna quickly load up the presentation of Professor Savic, and I will give the floor to you, uh, Professor Savic, now. Thank you, Melissa. Um, hello, everyone. Um, while I'm waiting for the presentation, uh, let me just um, say I'm so pleased to be here 
um, and, and to try and give you a glimpse of um, where we are in terms of uh, digital technologies and, and water. So uh, I'm just taking over the, the presentation. Yes. Um, and hopefully you will see uh, the starting slide. So we're talking about digital water future and uh, potential and, and challenges. I'm pretty sure you're all aware that um, we are collecting uh, and creating more um, data on a daily basis. Just think about the number of mobile phones and um, the quantity of data that we create just through that one means. Um, but the trend is accelerating so that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. So if we continue that trend, it's an exponential kind of um, increase. And with that, we also have the ability to measure everything um, from, I don't know, uh, heart rate, how many steps we do in a day to weather to, um, and that also relates um, to water, water services, water resources, the quality and so on. Um, so we can see that digital services transform, um, are transforming many aspects uh, of our world. For example, in transport, um, quite a lot of us have been using Uber um, or in tourism, Airbnb, or in banking, uh, almost everybody is using banking apps these days to manage their accounts, or in education with these massive online um, open courses or, or MOOC. So, um, you know, and what is it for the water? What does it mean for the water? Let's go back a little bit and, and think about um, where we are heading with water. With urbanization, over 70% of the population will live in cities by uh, 2050. Already more than a half of uh, world population lives in cities. On the other hand, more than 70% of the water, fresh water, is used for food production in agriculture. Um, and we have a, a bit of dichotomy there, dichotomy. And then climate change is affecting um, quite a lot. So that lots of people in the world, lots of areas will become kind of um, water scarce or will have a problem with water security in the future. So what is digital water or what are the building blocks? But the basic building block is the information and communication technologies. Um, now we have better ability to connect to each other with globalization and global information exchanges. A um, lot more sensors are in the um, you know, environment, collecting information, transmitting information, and we are getting data from all sources, from satellites, from built-in sensor, from uh, the people movement, and so on. And you must have heard about artificial intelligence. Lots of governments around the world are putting more uh, emphasis on the development in artificial intelligence or AI and how better to use modeling and analytics in making informed decisions. Part of it is also software. And we've been using software since personal computers have been introduced on a, on a very kind of wide basis, but even before that with mainframes. And then control technologies. How can we better control and manage our systems? And also how robotics can can help us better manage um, our water system. So now if we're talking about all these building blocks, I should mention that we are talking about cyber um, or digital systems and physical systems, are the real system water uh, systems that we're talking um, about here. So let me give you an example. Um, and this is an example from the um, developing world. Um, quite a lot of people uh, worldwide lack reliable access to high quality um, uh, drinking water at affordable prices. And 
um, water kiosks or water ATMs are one of the potential solutions. They actually deliver or dispense water instead of cash, like the bank um, ATMs. Or um, so they may be solar powered, or, or they may be on the main power. Uh, they can be cloud connected. So, and when I say cloud, I mean to this internet, IoT cloud, so that the information about the water quality, about the water usage, about the payments is already um, in the information and communication uh, cloud that people usually in the less um, developed or um, areas which are not supplied by the central kind of water supplies or don't have easy access to water, have access 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, which is cheaper than any other outlet. Um, I know in India, for example, uh, um, that water from these dispensers, from these ATMs, water ATMs, is cheaper 50 times than the bottled water that these people have to rely on. And also, they can use rechargeable cards or mobile phones to pay for it. So there is no need to bring cash, although quite a few of them operate with um, with cash. So what is the future for digital water? It is quite good because digitalization is happening already in all fields. And there will be more data. That's why big data is something um, that we will, water management will benefit from. Um, we will uh, also see more integration of data with various sources. So if you think about just what water utilities or water providers or government collect, then you can think about what is in the public domain, what we generate by using our phones and so on. Uh, then we will, with better data, more data, we could develop better models. And this term digital twins refers to these models that replicate inside a computer um, something that is physical, something that is our system. Um, there will be a bigger role for artificial intelligence. But when I say artificial intelligence, it's more like augmented intelligence, augmented human intelligence. So the computers will have help humans make better decisions, inform decision making. And with that, we will also look into more resilient cyber physical systems and services, because together these um, can do better uh, than just our systems and also rely more on cloud services. But there are buts always with the, with the new development and new challenges. Um, security is now not only related to the physical system, but also to the cyber system. So, you know, cyber attacks, um, privacy. If we are using more data, if we are using our individual data, our privacy has to be uh, protected. Legal concerns, whose is the data? If a water company or a utility collects my data, does that data belong to them? Can they sell it? Can they develop it into a new service? And that's also an ethical um, question. Then the problem or the challenge of IT skills. Not everybody is skilled in these IT areas. So how can we increase that? Maybe through education. And also access to technology and the internet. Not everybody has that kind of um, access. So with that, I will finish with a final thought uh, that there is no question whether the digital water is already here. It is. The question is how it is going to develop. And uh, International Water Association has um, authored uh, a paper, a white paper that is readily available on internet, um, which is called uh, Digital Water White Paper. It was published last year, and I will encourage you to look into it because it gives uh, interviews with, uh, I think, 49, 48 um, utilities around the world, including developing countries' utilities. 
with that, I'll finish my presentation and um, I'll be awaiting your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Savage, for this very interesting and visionary uh, presentation where we see a glimpse of what's already happening that uh, you know, could, could really help improve and enhance our, our management of water and water security more broadly. Um, I would encourage everyone who's listening in to, um, to please feel free to share any comments or questions in the chat box, uh, particularly if you have experience perhaps with some of these technologies or want to share some feedback or some interesting um, ideas that, that you may have. Uh, we will then, after the presentation, we'll take uh, some time to go through those questions uh, with you and with our, our presenters. And now I would like to hand over to Annika Kramer, who is um, Senior Project Manager at Adelphi and will present the potential of digital trends for reducing inequalities. Uh, Annika's work focuses on the field of international cooperation, resource governance, vulnerability and adaptation to climate change. And she is leading the consultancy mandate for SDC's Trend Observatory on Water. Anika, over to you. Anika, I am not sure whether you've activated your microphone. Uh... Okay, sorry, <laughs> same old, same old story. Thank you, Melissa, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in our webinar today. Um, as Dragan has pointed out, digitalization provides a number of opportunities for improved water management, but of course it also comes along with some challenges and risks, as he mentioned. Now, in our first trend sheet for the STC Trend Observatory on Water, we highlighted how digitalization can also help address one of the very important gaps that we see in water security today, namely the inequalities that remain. And I will uh, dig a bit deeper into this issue now in my presentation and also provide some examples of how this has been applied in developing countries. Now, just as a background, some words on, on what we mean by water security. Um, we, for in, in this trend sheet, we consider water security to include aspects of access to water resources in appropriate quantity and quality, for example, for subsistence farming. It includes access to safe water supply and sanitation, but also protection from water-related disasters. Over the past decades, significant progress has been made, especially in providing access to safe water supply. However, as for example, the last World Water Development Report on leaving no one behind has shown, there are significant equalities still, and ever so often disadvantaged groups of society, such as the poor, women, or ethnic minorities, are left behind. If we look, for example, at access to basic drinking water services, 60% of the urban population worldwide have access to basic drinking water services. But if we look at rural areas, this number only reaches 20%. In the same lines, uh, the poor are often much more vulnerable to water-related disasters as they tend to live in low-quality housing and in flood-prone or drought-prone regions. And when water resources are allocated, for example, for irrigation, as I mentioned, women ethnic and other minority smallhold farmers regularly do not get fair shares of available water resources. Now, how can digital technologies help address these in inequalities? We have identified four general approaches, as Daniel has also already mentioned, or, uh, but just as a, a quick Reminder so you don't get, don't get lost in the remaining presentation. Digital technologies can help improve monitoring of water resources, but also monitoring access to wash services. They can facilitate participation in decision making and access to information. They can support proper water financing and tariffs and increase transparency in allocation. So how do technologies facilitate monitoring? They provide a comparatively cheap and easy 
solution um, approaches range from citizen data collection for monitoring of water quality to high-tech solutions such as remote sensing and drones to motor water resources and uh, or robotics to inspect pipe systems. Those technologies are particularly helpful in areas that are difficult to access, such as remote areas or densely populated informal settlements. Better monitoring can help identify inefficiencies and inequalities in water monitoring, which in turn will allow to address these inequalities and thereby increase availability and quality of water resources, especially in the less attended areas. One example of how monitoring helps address uh, um, or it helps monitoring inequalities in access to sanitation is, uh, is the example of the One World Foundation in India. They developed a smartphone application that enables villages to collect data on their sanitation behavior. And the app also includes features such as geotagging and photographs to make the results more illustrative, credible, and, and relevant also. The data is then presented in user-friendly maps that provide an exact overview of the sanitation situation in rural areas and allows uh, regional or local governments to act accordingly. A second way how digital technologies help address inequalities is through facilitating communication and participation, as I mentioned. Digital devices offer low cost and efficient means for raising awareness, educating people and providing access to information. This not only helps inform people, to example, to warn them of floods, it also facilitates them to participate in water planning and decision making through online service, etc. Digital communication also allows reaching out and involving groups of society who are otherwise difficult to contact, such as women, elderly, or disabled, who often stay at home, or people living in remote areas. The, providing access to relevant information empowers NGOs, civil society organizations, or marginalized groups to advocate for their interests. Then the digital communication channels support them in raising their voice in decision making. Now looking at an example, uh, the open data portal on water points uh, in West Africa prepared by ACVO uh, or developed by ACVO gives a very nice example. They mapped uh, water points across Western Africa and display them in interactive maps that also provide data analysis feature for water point functionality, but also quality and the level of payments. This allows governments to make informed decisions and uh, even looking at uh, also addressing issues in remote areas, but it also provides open and easy access to this information and thus empowers citizens uh, to lobby for improved access to water resources in their areas. Digital technologies also provide opportunities for innovative funding. Um, providing poor and remote areas often does not recover the needed costs. Here digital solutions can help by finding ways to ensure collection of funds or by introducing crowdsourcing. This can support uh, increased revenue and financing for those services, especially in in rural and poor urban areas that are often less attended. An example is the work of the Safe Water Network um, in Ghana, but they also did that in many other countries, where they supported community-based operators by installing small water meters and households, and they also showed customers how to use the mobile phones to store, send, and receive monies. This helped households to plan their water expenditures better. And in consequence, uh, households consumed 27% less water and the stations took in 18% more revenue. The community-based operator doubled its payment collection rate 
and the time spent on collection, collecting payments. While these automated payment collections have, have uh, been tested a lot in, in urban areas, this example shows that it also helps to uh, support community operators, uh, community-based oper operators uh, in rural areas, which we see as a, as a great innovation in this regard. Last but not least, digital technologies can increase transparency by visualizing and tracing water distribution and then based on this information, holding decision makers accountable. Whistleblowing and anti-corruption platforms can help detect corruption, which is one of the big reasons uh, why, why um, money gets lost in the water sector. And again, it's, it's uh, the poor and marginalized, marginalized which are disproportionately affected by this. One example for digital uh, fighting against corruption or whistleblowing is, is the Phones Against Corruption initiative that was piloted in Papua New Guinea, um, which uses a, a simple SMS service um, where a user just sends a message to a free phone phone number and reports on corruption by responding to several short questions. In this case, the, in Papua New Guinea, it has not been specifically used for the water sector, but it's, we see it as one of the uh, opportunities where corruption in the water sector can be, can be fought and, and thus uh, increase money available for providing wash services also to the poor. Now with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and looking forward to the discussion and your comments in the remaining webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anika, for this, this presentation with lots of very uh, good examples of what digital water means today already in um, low income and middle income countries. So that was very insightful. Um, thank you so much. I will now um, hand over the, the, the floor to our discussant, uh, Jacques Rouva. Jacques is actually based in Mali, so we are not sure whether the connection is, uh, is good today. We will check now shortly. Um, but in case he cannot make his, um, his uh, contribution, we have a recording of it ready so we can play it for you. But I'm just going to check if Jacques can say um, some of his thoughts, share some of his thoughts now live. Uh, with us, if the connection is good enough. Jacques, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think the connection is good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, sorry about my English, which is uh, really bad. <laughs> Uh, thanks to the two presenters, I just would like to make a little connection with what we are doing in the field. New technologies are an integral part of the context, and this is particularly true of the mobile phone that is now found even in the most remote parts of the world. It should also be noted that development projects do not finance the purchase of telephones or credit nor do they train users who are often illiterate to use the telephone. And yet people are doing very well. So the arguments put forward when the villagers do not pay for water, they are too poor, they have no money, or when the hand pump is not repaired, they are illiterate, they cannot understand. These arguments are most probably wrong. But to come back to the subject, and more precisely to the two presentations, as Dragan said, the findings are not open to discussion. Digital water is already here. The question now is how best to use technologies that will be useful so that everyone, especially those in disadvantaged countries, minorities, and all those in a vulnerable position can have a better water service. Already access to information is completely disrupted 
using the smartphone to collect data allows a speed and efficiency that has nothing to compare with the whole paper and pencil methods. But beware, while servers are much easier to conduct, it's not the smartphone that formulates the question, nor does it analyze the data collected. Competence in questionnaire design and data processing remains essential. The speed of information transfer is a fundamental asset. This allows for a very high level of reactivity and efficiency. For example, in Paracou, Benin, thanks to a smartphone application, users who want their latrine pit to be emptied can identify and contact the nearest emptying truck so that it, it can intervene as quickly as possible. Having a lot of information will provide a more realistic view of aquifers and integrated water resource management will be improved. With the help of artificial intelligence, the management of all these data should help in the fight against climate change and contribute to anticipating problems. Anonymity is also a strong point a strong point in all matters relating to accountability and respect for the rights and duties of users. Social networks are, for example, a means of pressure within everyone's reach. Just one example. A Malian villager had been swindled by the police. He explained his misadventures on Facebook and the official concerned quickly rectified the situation. With WhatsApp, you can quickly exchange text, images, and videos. It's especially useful for mobilizing people denouncing unacceptable things, but it is particularly useful in everyday work with colleagues who remain virtually close, even if they are on the other side of the country. Behind information, transferring money can also make a difference. Paying with the phone allows you to get rid of cash, when you pay, no need to give change. And the tracking of both consumption and expenses is valuable information to improve the quality of service. But in this particular case of water kiosks, you must not lose sight of the associated mechanical aspects. Sorry. The pump, the dispenser, and the entire system that delivers the water remains a complex assembly that must be maintained and repaired. Finally, these new technologies are changing the way we work and opening up particularly interesting prospects. But make no mistake, if the survey data are directly accessible on the cloud, or if the canister is filled with the simple use of the telephone, it always takes a competent sociologist to formulate the question and an experienced technician to operate the pump. Thank you for all. Thank you so much, Jacques. That was very clear to, to me and to everyone. Um, I think uh, no problem at all on our side. And I really appreciate your feedback based on your experience in the field, uh, as well as um, your word of caution against, you know, not losing sight of the, the wider skills that are necessary in order to manage water and provide access to water and sanitation services. So now that we have uh, uh, finalized the presentations and we've heard from our discussants, we'd like to open the floor to the questions and comments uh, we have received in the chat box from all of you. Uh, so I would like to keep encouraging you to ask any questions or, or comments there in the chat box and we'll take them one by one and go through them with our speakers. I'd like to start with two questions actually, which are kind of related that were po posed almost at the same time by um, Thea Bonkertman and Daniel Maselli, which is about uh, the inequality and in access to this digital data and information from it. Because as Thea says, um, technically a lot is possible for transparent and accountable water management, but who has IT skills and access to technology and the internet? It's quite skewed towards international wash ex experts or highly educated experts in countries. Uh, and Daniel says, you know, should we expect, because digital water is happening already and will happen more and more, should we expect a possibly larger and deeper divide between the haves and don't haves in the future at the global level? If this is not to be feared, why? If this might happen, what should we do to minimize the increase of this already existing divide? So I would like to start by asking these 
questions, the set of questions to uh, Dragan and then to Anika. Uh, Dragan, can you please share your, your thoughts on this? Thank you. Well, I think um, that's a very good question. And um, thank you to Jacques, because I think he already touched upon it, because, um, um, yeah, it may ha be a divide, but it's not that huge in my mind, because um, people uh, are using mobile phones everywhere around the globe. And mobile phones have changed lives of people. And also, in the less developed world, mobile phone technology um, has shown how this um, part of our population can leapfrog some old technologies that, for example, in the West um, have been used, which is the, the fixed phone uh, technology. So. Um, that part of the world has already kind of leapfrog into the new um, uh, technology and uh, using the technology. So I wouldn't um, say it's that huge. If you're talking about organizational kind of um, development and divide so that in the West you have the infrastructure that is much better, um, I think you're right in that sense, but um, I think the, the um, utilities, particularly water utilities, wastewater utilities, are a bit behind in the uh, cities, in the de developing world, are catching up with this um, new technology. I think also the education play, will play um, a role there, and particularly online education with these MOOCs, uh, massive uh, open online courses where uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, if you have reasonably decent internet connection, you will be able to um, kind of join and, um, and learn something new, particularly, again, about uh, the digital uh, transformation, digital water and, and management. So, in a sense, I'm very optimistic about this because uh, people use technology sometimes in anger, sometimes um, um, because they, they have it uh, and because they will have to use it. And that's how water, for example, this uh, few examples that Annika and I have shown will benefit from it. And the divide will be reduced by using digital technology. I don't think it will uh, kind of be increased. I don't know okay. whether that answers your question. <laughs> a very optimistic response from, from Dragan. I would just like to point out in the chat box that Thea says, you know, uh, calling and transferring money by mobile phones is completely different from managing water data. So she's not convinced uh, uh, with respect to this uh, this optimistic overview. But perhaps we can hear now from Anika. What, what are your thoughts on this question, Anika? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the very relevant Questions and also uh, thanks, uh, Jacques, for your for your very spot on on intervention. Um, of course, there's there's a lot of limitations also to digital technologies to address inequalities, and and Jacques has mentioned many of them. So I I'm I didn't mean to say that they will solve everything. Um, uh, maybe I even uh, left out the critical aspect, so I can uh, we can get uh, Jacques from the field to to give a much more insightful view on that. Um, yes. So having said this, I I'm, I don't think the, the, the digital technologies will help to solve the whole problem. They they will not fight illiteracy and and lack of education that is that is also necessary. But I think they they provide. Um, a means to to get um, contact to to more people and even those with probably limited literacy skills. As for example, you can I mean digital technology and mobile phones. You can send uh, voice messages. You don't even have to write. And and if you use digital technologies, you can you can use simple icons to describe situations, etc. So. Um, while they won't solve the whole problem, I see a lot of opportunities, and also I don't think that they will 
increase the divide. They will not completely level it, level it out for sure. As, I mean, if, if you look at uh, how uh, some uh, prognosis on how the internet is going to be used, more and more people are going to have access, but will they be able to, to use it? Mm, this, of course, also depends on, on education and, and literacy for sure. Um, was the, that was the main question. Melissa, was there a, a second point you wanted me to address? No, no, this is this is fine. Thank you very much. I would also like to say that your answer uh, sort of responds to a question we had also from Milan Jan, which asked, what is the better way to transfer knowledge of digital technologies in rural populations where literacy is higher? And you mentioned, you know, voice messages and icons and so on. Is there anything else you want to to do? Do you have any other um, examples or experience of how this can be done in the context of um, illiter illiteracy, uh, and particularly in rural in rural areas. This is the question from from Nilan Jan. Mm, right now, those two are the are the the ones that come to the to the top of my mind. But of course, I mean, in in designing the applications, this this will help. But for sure, I mean, as as Jack has also mentioned, it's I mean, it's not digital technology that will ask the right questions. It still needs it still needs sociologists and and mechanics, water engineers, that can then fix the situation. Yeah, thank you so much for this. This is it's good to hear from both of you that you're quite optimistic and see that this is more um, more of a positive step towards uh, reducing inequalities or bridging that that gap. And we have a lot of questions coming through, so I would like to jump straight into a question asked by Lauren Pope, actually two questions. Um, is there any area you would like to see digital tools to be advancing and innovating that just isn't possible yet, for example, because it's too expensive? And the second question, which she also posed, can you discuss in your experience, any possible downfalls of using mobile pay functionalities for projects, interventions, I think I should say in development context. So perhaps I will ask uh, Dragan first uh, for your, your opinion on this. So areas where you see that digital tools are not advancing or innovating as fast as you think in the water sector. And, and secondly, possible downfalls of using mobile pay. Okay. Um... I think we are touching now an interesting area, um, which is um, do we develop these digital um, kind of uh, transformation um, tools, applications, uh, just for the sake of being digitalized, or are we solving something? Are we addressing some of the challenges? And this is the beauty of digital technology that it is open to innovation. So new business models, the ATMs that I mentioned are the new business model, the smart pumps that are being used um, in uh, certain areas of Africa where, again, the information about whether the pump is operational or needs a maintenance is, again, sent to the cloud. So there is um, kind of uh, understanding whether somebody needs to go and maintain or operate um, uh, the pump, water pump, is um, very important. But <clears throat> those two examples are of new business models. So what we are talking about here is the uh, ability of the technology available for us to try and innovate, explore new ways of using that technology. Um, so, if you, if the question is um, innovation that is not possible, I would say um, we haven't come up with all the solutions that the current technology is providing, let alone looking for um, a new technology that um, is limiting our ability to do something. So that's that's my view on um, on that one. I was wondering if. Um, you want to give Anika uh, an opportunity to, to respond to that, and then we can go to the second part of the question. Or... Uh, sure. 
Anika, if there's something you'd like to add on this on this area, which you think digital technologies has, you know, has not advanced as much as you'd hope. Mm. Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a progress in, in, in general. So I couldn't think of a specific area I, I would want to, uh, I, I could, I would want it to progress uh, faster. But th taking the the second question of the of mobile payments and uh, and the downsides of it, mm, of course, I think there's a risk that if if payments are transferred to mobile payments uh, and then you can only pay by mobile phone, this of course has a risk if so that the poorest of society probably don't have a mobile phone or uh, so you need to find alternative ways for them to get access or um, that's that's the one and then also the whole question about prepayment or then you have prepayment on your mobile phone probably prepay or you prepay your water um, the question is then what happens if if no money is left on your on your account or in your on your water water account. Uh, does that result in disconnection? So there's a lot of questions uh, about providing, I mean, the human right to water and making sure that uh, uh, a minimum uh, access to water is ensured, which mobile payment in itself, of course, cannot solve. Again, that comes back to the question of uh, to what to Jacques' intervention um, is like, who, who, who asks a question and uh, and who ensures that everyone has access. So thank you, Anika. So if I understand correctly, it could, it's one option, but it should never be the only option because you risk then to increase the inequality of, of access. Is that correct? Yeah, or there has to be like a, let's say, a, a safety net, or you have, they have to, I mean, all, all possibilities have to be thought through so that to make sure that no one gets disconnected. Mm -hmm. And Dragan, what is your, your view on, on this uh, briefly, if possible? Um, just very briefly, there was a related question that says that calling and transferring money by mobile phones is completely different from managing water data. And I would agree with that one. But on the other hand, uh, allowing people to pay by uh, mobile phone when they access water services um, is an advantage. So it's the the model that is um, that is developed or business model that was developed around mobile payment, but this time for water. That's where the innovation comes in. Not with the mobile phone because it's already there. The technology is there. How we use the technology. I would remind everybody again about the Uber model. Without before they came up with that idea uh, to order. Um, taxi or Uber by phone and pay by phone, people were always looking, can I find a taxi? Can I have enough cash on me? Do they take credit cards? Now everything is done online. So that's a new business model, but mobile phones and cars existed before that. It's so true. that's where we <laughs> need to look for innovation. It's true. It's true. And I thank you for, for this this. Uh... A reflection and word of encouragement and I would just like to pick up on a couple of there are many questions and comments that have come through uh, one of them saying that the current discussion is focusing on wash but there is much more of course especially for water resources management and on that note the question came through from Daniel Maselli should we expect more small-scale internet-based water trading water resources management. Similarly, as we are saying in relation to small-scale energy trading on the Swiss market, what will happen to the water price in the future of different regions of the world? And we know, for example, in Australia, the Murray Darling Basin, there is water trading that has been happening that is powered by the internet. But I wonder if our two presenters uh, have some other examples of this, of this happening for water resources management more specifically. So perhaps I'll start with Anika this time and then Dragan. Yeah, thank you. I would like to take up the question of whether we should expect water prices to, to increase. Um, well, I I mean, if you asking whether they were going to increase because of digitalization, that's that's really the question. I think um, uh, I think as digitalization provides opportunities to identify inefficiencies and and then also collecting payments more 
easily, be it for um, be it for wash services or water resources, if if there's payments for water resources, for example, as an as an irrigation. So as they allow to to identify inefficiencies and and track money, etc. I I think uh, they would make the more the water sector more economically more efficient. Then the question of water pricing, of course, is a, is a very political one. So it's I don't think that it's the digital technology that will that will decide on this. Uh, but they, it has a potential to to make it more economic efficient, economically efficient. Thank you, Anika. Uh, Dragan, what about you? What what are your thoughts on this water trading? Um, do you see it happening more on a small scale now? Is there are there examples also in developing countries of this being happen, happening more and more? As far as far as I know, this is happening more in the developed world. So California is another example where uh, water allocation and trading um, is happening. Um, and um, again, um, talking about these. I'm going back to this example of uh, water ATMs. That's another example of water trading. Um, an entrepreneur is buying water from the uh, local water company, selling it through this ATM, selling it 50% cheaper than uh, these people pay for bottled water. So uh, in that sense, the argument is um, in the other direction. The water will be cheaper um, to uh, the people using this particular service. Um, so, again, the opportunities for um, efficiencies in delivering, in, in paying for water, are much higher with digital uh, means. Okay, so you see it, again, quite positively um, as, as, as a way to improve, actually, the, the, the efficiency of, of uh, water uh, water uh, services and water pricing as well. Thank you so much. I We have many, many questions that have come through. I just want to point out a few things um, that have come through that could be of interest. Uh, one of our participants, Godfred, Godfred, is doing his MSc dissertation on mobile water payments in urban Ghana. So if anyone's interested, he has put his email address um, and can be contacted for discussions. Uh, he just wants to, to point that out. It's in the chat box. Uh, there. Uh, Daniel just had a little comment about on water trading. Um, prices for other raw materials other than water are also being manipulated by larger trader platforms, um, the Neva platform, impacting seriously on global price markets. And he believes that some kind of safeguards will have to be built. In. So a word of caution also on, on this. Um, we are just five minutes away from the end of the webinar. So I would just like to quickly ask everyone for um, your feedback on this webinar. What did you think? Uh, was it useful? Was it interesting? Uh, do you have any comments on how we can we can uh, improve? Um, I would like to ask you if you could please rate this webinar uh, from one to 10, with 10 being the highest note um, in the chat box. And leave us a comment if you think we should do things differently next time or what you would like to hear about uh, on our next webinar, what you liked, what you didn't like. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers and to ask for a one minute short reflection from Anika and from uh, Dragan on the webinar. Uh, what are their concluding thoughts? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And and thank you everyone for the very interesting questions in the in the chat box it was it, it's very difficult to read them all and then also be be listening to what other people say and and talking yourself so uh, sorry if we couldn't answer all of them so i invite you to take a take a look at the at the trend sheet um and to contact us uh with with any comments we would be happy to to discuss further and also to learn about your experiences in applying some of those technologies. Um, for sure, I'm, I'm happy that Jack uh, took took on the hat to, to take a critical look at it. And we shouldn't forget that, uh, I mean, with digital uh, technologies, we cannot we cannot solve very important questions of power, etc. So thank you, everyone, for, for also your very thoughtful comments. Thank you, Anika. Dragan, any last words from your, your side? 
Just very briefly, um, like any technology, uh, digital technology is open for abuse and misuse. So um, I think we need to balance the risks and benefits or uh, potential benefits of this technology. And um, also, um, thank you very much for um, joining us today. I, uh, I enjoyed it immensely, and uh, I would be available also to answer any questions if that's possible, te technically possible. Great. Uh, yes, I would also like to thank all the participants because everyone was very engaged. We had some excellent, excellent um, questions coming through. We weren't able to address all of them. Uh, I would ask the presenters if they would like to be in touch with people that if they could write their um, contact details in the in the chat box. Um, and we will also be sharing the webinar presentations, a recording and a summary of the webinar on the link, which is now on the screen. And my colleague Elodie will also paste it in the chat box. So uh, I will, will share that with everyone who, um, who registered for this webinar today. So from our side, we were very pleased um, to, to have you all. And I would like to thank uh, all the speakers, the participants, and all the support team as well in the background for their efforts in organizing the webinar. So thank you all. Thank you for tuning in today to this Réseau webinar. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>